happy to see that uh, some people decided that this would be more interesting than listening to Steve Wozniak. Short pause to allow those who realize they're in the wrong room to... <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk about uh, building a blockchain in Erlang. And uh, a quick reminder for those of you who haven't realized that you can uh, rate sessions. Remember to rate the session afterwards. Um, I haven't been uh, around in the, in the conference circuit in a, in a while, so I thought I uh, may present myself. I uh, started basically back in 89, working in the US with command and control disaster response in Alaska, of all places. I discovered Erlang when I was back in, uh, in Sweden, uh, which is my uh, home country, back in 92. I joined Ericsson expressly to develop, uh, to code in Erlang back in 96, and uh, I was there uh, until 2008, and then joined uh, Erlang Solutions as their CTO. And um, since about 2011, I've been uh, freelancing. I have my own company, uh, also try to be a little bit of an entrepreneur, mostly on the singing side, actually. I, uh, I um, have a side career as an opera singer. And uh, for the last two years, I've been uh, in the blockchain space uh, with the Eternity blockchain core team. And um, in the Erlang community, well, you will find uh, some components on GitHub that I'm responsible for, uh, a fairly popular process registry called GProc, uh, load regulation framework called Jobs, uh, metrics package called Dexameter, uh, a slightly weird uh, distributed locker, and uh, a small experiment called unsplit, which is uh, surprisingly used by a lot of people who worry about net splits in the Erlang database. I also have a couple of contributions uh, that are actually part of OTP, um, one called XML, and apologies to those who have tried to use it and uh, don't like it much. I'm not terribly proud of that, but I was the first to uh, build an XML package in Erlang. Uh, and a few other things, partly related to Mnesia, the database, which has been a special interest of mine. Now, how many of you have actually coded in Erlang? Show of hands. Okay, about half, I would say. Okay, how many of you... This clicker... Oh, there. How many of you are familiar with blockchains? That is, know basically how they work. Okay, also slightly less than half. I will give you a one-slide Erlang primer. So after this, you will actually know what Erlang is and how to code in it. It's a mostly functional language. Uh, you could also call it declarative or symbolic. It is dynamically typed. Um, you could be more specifically, it is strongly typed in that you can't subvert the type system, but it doesn't have any static type check, any static type checking to speak of. It is garbage collected. It is concurrency oriented, which is a bit rare. It's also fault tolerant, and I will show a few things to indicate what, what that means. Uh, one of the things that will trip up beginners is the punctuation, which is, uh, you could say, a bit anal, um, but very uh, regular. It's what I would call an opinionated language. It has a fairly clear style, um, and uh, you will tend to know if your ideas are not in line with how Erlang wants you to code. And uh, so beginners 
coming from the object-oriented world will probably spend a couple of months trying to make Erlang object-oriented, and then they will give up and either go with the flow or go with another language. Erlang is not object-oriented. So here is a little bit of code. It's actually mainly an example, but you can see this pattern in some code. I use it a couple of times, uh, occasionally myself. I will go through it uh, because it contains most of the things that may be of interest. So kind of like um, you, you use modules as a structuring concept. Um, and from modules, you export the functions. This is number of arguments, function name and number of arguments. Uh, and those will be the functions that are callable from the outside. And here, I have an implementation of a parallel map. Those of you familiar with functional programming uh, know about the map function. Essentially, you will take a list of inputs and an anonymous function, a function object. You apply that function object to all values in the list, and then you get a result. But the weirdness of this one is that it actually does um, all those applications in parallel or concurrently and then collects the results and produces a list that is actually in the same order as the input arguments. So how do you do that? Um, this is called a list comprehension. It means for all, every value v in the list of value, vals, you do this, and uh, you present, you produce a list which is this expression applied to each V. And here you form a tuple, which is like an array, essentially, uh, with a value. And here we spawn a process. We spawn and monitor the process. A monitor in Erlang is a one-way supervision, essentially. We will know, be notified if that process dies. Otherwise, there is a plain spawn function, which is spawns a process, and we have no connection to it. Um, we just get the process ID. Here, we get the process ID and a monitor reference. I will get back to that. And the f process we spawn will start in this function. It will apply this function object. And what this does, surprisingly, perhaps, it simply exits. But it's allowed to produce an exit reason. And here, we apply the function f on the value v that we inherited from the context. And then we wrap it in a tuple. Um, this will become clearer later on. And then, comma, end of expression. Next is another list comprehension where PS is this, the result from the first operation here, where for each v value V and process reference P return, well, we return the value and then we collect the result. We get here. This is another function. In Erlang, you often do pattern matching in function heads. So here we expect, we basically assert, that the input is a two-tuple, a tuple of two elements, where the first is p, the other is called ref. At this point, we don't know what the types are. Erlang is dynamically typed. Um, there are type specifications, but they're mainly for documentation. Now we go into a blocking receive statement. This is another weirdness of Erlang. It has um, what's called selective receive. So we provide a pattern to the receive statement, basically saying we will wait for this exact message, which is a tuple of five elements where this first one is the label down, 
This is what's produced from the monitor. The second is ref. Now ref in this context is already bound. We bound that there. So this has to match that. This is just a label process. And this is the process ID, P, which we bound there. So we're going to wait for exactly the process P with the monitor reference ref that we called from here. Anything else is going to stay in the message queue. So this actually then preserves order. We had the order vowels, and here we went through the list in order. Here we went through the next list in order. The, these messages may not come in in order, but we don't care. We actually reorder the results here implicitly. And here we assert that the reason is OK, comma, something, which is actually the result from up here. So this is actually quite uh, common as a pattern in Erlang. You do pattern matching as a form of assertion. If reason is anything else, this means that this function application up here crashed. And then it will exit in this, uh, inside this function as a runtime error. So it will not be this expression that we exit with, but the actual reason for the exit here. And then this will not match, because this will not match any actual exit reason from a runtime error. But, so if we get a runtime error from this uh, function up here, that this function will raise an exception, and this one will. So then the map function, as it should, will actually raise an exception to the caller. And the result of the function is whatever the last expression uh, returned. All clear? That's a lot of function packed into a few lines. But <clears throat> this is sort of, um, it illustrates a lot of the key aspects of Erlang. It really wants you to use processes. Now in this case, uh, spawning a function takes about a microsecond. So you wouldn't want to do this. There we go. But just for demonstration, I compile the function or the module, and then I call it with an anonymous function that just takes x and multiplies it by 2. And then I input a list sequence 1 to 5, and it returns the input value and the output value, all in order, as you can see. Now, obviously, spawning a process takes longer than multiplying an integer, so in this case, it would be extremely stupid to use a parallel map. But it only takes, on a modern machine, roughly one microsecond to spawn a process. So it doesn't have to be uh, an incredible amount of work for this to actually pay off. So, but it's so easy to write that there is no library function that does this. So, if you want to do this, you can, you can write it by hand, and this is essentially the pattern that you would use. Now, the monitor function is actually quite important because it allows you to um, supervise even very lightweight dialogues. So if a process, for example, wants to call another process and request uh, some operation or a value, what the standard gen generic server call function does is that it actually creates a one-way monitor first. And then it passes that to the other process and say, says, well, by convention, the server will pass that reference back. So then you can do this sort of pattern matching on the reply. So you know that that reply is an answer to your question but also you have a supervision, so if that process dies trying to provide a reply, you get an immediate notification. So this is extremely 
useful and allows you to write very robust code. Now, that was Erlang in one slide. This clicker is not working very well. Maybe the battery or... So, blockchain. You could say that blockchains are extremely slow append-only file systems. Performance is not uh, a thing with blockchains, or at least not high performance. The thing that is really key to blockchain is no trust. So you have essentially a peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes participating in a chain, so it's fully distributed, and you don't have to trust any other participant in the network. Now, that is quite a disruptive requirement because it means that pretty much no algorithms, distributed algorithms that you're familiar with, except gossip, perhaps, will actually work. Because just about every distributed algorithm for consensus, uh, for example, a leader election, whatever, Practically every algorithm ever invented assumes that you can at least trust the other parties that are talking in the protocol. With blockchain, you throw that out the window. Uh, so what do you trust? Basically, the only thing you trust is cryptographic proofs. So you pass information to each other, and you rely on cryptography to provide you with the opportunity to, to verify, to prove that what you got is actually correct. I will show you sort of a simplified uh, chain of events here. So say you have a transaction. The simple transaction would be, I want to spend some tokens here, too, which in blockchain world is an extremely small amount, from some account identified by a public key to another account identified by a public key. Usually, if that to account doesn't exist, it will be created as soon as that transaction makes it onto the chain. So what you do is you serialize that, you sign it cryptographically, and then you throw it into something called a mempool, where all transactions, pending transactions live. Someone, could be you, uh, these are typically called miners, um, will create a block that cons consists of a bunch of transactions. You hash them all together, you get a hash identifying the block and a hash identifying the top block on the chain. All that is hashed together. And then you try to solve a crypto puzzle. Now this is a new... Um, these look different in different blockchains. The simple way would be to just try to hash these. You can tweak one little counter in this block. It's called a nonce. And then you hash everything and you try to get the hash result to fit a small window. This would be the simplest uh, crypto puzzle. And that window is shrunk if you have lots of miners making the puzzle more difficult to um, to solve. And if you solve it, then you have a valid block and you can append that to the chain, eventually collect a reward if once you've gossiped that block to peers, um, to your peers, and they accept that as a valid block, and the next valid block, because there can be other miners who have also solved the puzzle in the same time, and this is an optimistic concurrency problem. Um, but eventually, one will win, and uh, if your block has been on the chain for a number of blocks, uh, iterations, you will collect an award for being able to put a block on the chain. This is essentially how it works. So this blockchain keeps uh, growing. But you can also understand now that this is 
uh, a very, very costly operation. This is called proof of work. It's supposed to be really difficult to solve um, and really cheap to verify. That's the key. So you get a lot of candidate blocks from other peers and you can very quickly verify if it is a valid solution to the, the puzzle at that specific height. Okay? Thank you. Oh, look at that. So, I represent the Eternity blockchain, and uh, the Eternity blockchain is one of the few new blockchains that actually is developed from scratch. Uh, almost the only proof-of-work blockchain that's developed from scratch. Most blockchains that you find out there are essentially spin-offs of Bitcoin or Ethereum. And then there are some blockchains that are trying for high performance, but they use a different consensus algorithm called proof of stake, which is different. Um, I'm not going to get into which one is best, but it's of course proof of work. Um, we use a consensus model that's similar to Bitcoin, but it's called Bitcoin NG. And that means we mine for what we call key blocks that actually don't contain any transactions. And if you're lucky, and uh, you get to mine a key block, then you are the designated leader for a generation until a new key block is mined. And during that time, you can produce blocks and sign them and distribute them every, thir every three seconds. So it may take three minutes. We tune the puzzle so that it takes about three minutes to, to uh, solve a puzzle on average. And then every three seconds, once you've uh, become the leader, you can generate what's called a microblock. So if you post a transaction, you can get notification, first notification within about three seconds. And we can push about 100 transactions per second, which in the blockchain world is a lot. In the database world, <laughs> um, not so much. We have a smart contract language called Sophia. Um, it's a functional language that we designed. Quite nice, I would say. Uh, ML variety. Now the uh, smart contract is essentially code that you compile and you can put into a transaction that gets on the blockchain. And you can actually then call a contract that's on the blockchain and the result also ends up on the blockchain. Uh, also then the world's slowest cloud computing environment. But no trust, which is nice. So what we've done in, uh, in Eternity is to try to take some interesting use cases that are built on blockchain and make them into first class objects on the chain. So one of those things would be state channels. I'll get into those a little bit more. Oracles, which are essentially ports to the outside world. You can request a query out to, say, a web page or a market or whatever, and the result gets fed into a contract, which is, which is executed, and you pay for that, and you get the result. Uh, naming system, kind of like DNS, so you can uh, register a name on the, um, on the blockchain, and then you can refer to contracts by name in your domain, for example. Generalized accounts, which is, if you don't like, our way of authenticating um, transactions, and you would like, say, the Ethereum way of authenticating, you could actually plug that in, or you could make more uh, uh, fancier, say, context-sensitive or transaction-specific authentication which means you could actually have a contract that automates, automatically authenticates um, transactions, which would be interesting in a server environment, for example. So that's what we do. This is all written in Erlang. Well, the core of it is. The, um, then we have uh, SDKs in Go, in JavaScript, whatever. We also have a 
uh, state channel client environment in Elixir. I'm not going to talk about those today. Now, so when you pick a language like Erlang, I would assume that most people would think that as an initial uh, objection that it's going to be slow. But if you think about blockchains in terms of performance, there are very few parts that are performance critical. The, the proof of work aspect is performance critical. Um, hashing and signatures, but the thing there is that not only do you want to use C for that, you want to use a specific C library that is well known and trusted by users. So if you roll your own crypto, few people are going to want to use your blockchain. So you want to use uh, Libsodium, for example, because that's actually um, a trusted crypto library. So what we do in, um, in Erlang then is that we we uh, uh, link in Libsodium, for example, the proof of work, the mining aspect, we don't link that into the Erlang VM that's actually run as a separate process. And as it turns out, it probably doesn't even run on your computer. You may um, want to uh, farm that out to GPUs, for example. So then you have a separate application outside the Erlang world or possibly inside Erlang that interfaces to GPUs and they do the mining and you collect the results from there. So the mining code, yes, there is a C implementation. That's mainly for testing because mining on a CPU is useless in blockchain world. Mining on GPUs is almost useless. Usually you mine on ASICs sometimes on GPUs still. There is a lot of networking and quite chatty networking because remember you can't trust anyone, so then you can't trust anyone to relay the information that you want others to know. So you actually have to talk to pretty much everyone or you have a number of peers that you send all the information to and then you rely on at least not all of them being uh, malicious so if you send information to enough peers and they are supposed to gossip it um, further, eventually information will actually spread to the entire network. So you get a lot of communication on the network. So, <clears throat> and also this is a moving target. We're still trying to figure out not only what we're supposed to use blockchains for, there are some ideas, but... Um, um, not so many applications that, are, that have taken off yet, but also how to take the next steps to make this a really useful technology. Personally, I think that it's gonna be, it's gonna be disruptive in some ways. It's hard to know exactly how yet. So, how does Erlang help then in this? Erlang, is designed to model loosely coupled systems. This is a very important part of uh, fault tolerance. It was originally designed for building telecom systems and uh, specifically control systems inside telephone switches, for example. So you have, uh, you may not know how telephone switches work, but usually you have tons of different physical devices that need to be managed, supervised, and you also uh, need to uh, allocate resources in, down on, in the data plane. And this is what the control system does. It negotiates uh, data resources, essentially, in the, uh, in the data plane. And you need to do this in a way where all these devices are isolated from each other so that if one breaks, that doesn't break the entire system. And also you want this to evolve over time because you're selling a system that may actually be on the market for 20 years, needs to be upgraded in service. So it's part of Erlang's DNA to be loosely coupled uh, with components that are fairly isolated from each other. 
So that is kind of nice when you're actually doing exploratory programming and you don't know exactly how the system is going to evolve over time. So we've done a lot of refactoring. We've added things as we've gone along. And um, so essentially, a lot of blockchains will have mostly this and, of course, the mining component and transaction support. Ethereum has contracts. Bitcoin doesn't. And then these things are often built on top, not part of the actual blockchain. It doesn't know about them. They are usually implemented as contracts or as services on the side. We've baked them into the system. So then this kind of becomes the entire blockchain core that we're, we're building. It's about 100,000 lines of Erlang code right now. And I think this is an area where Erlang actually helps quite a lot. Um, I will argue that Erlang does concurrency extremely well. That is, is its main claim to fame. And the fairly unique part is that it has a very elegant and efficient concurrency a construct or a set of concurrency constructs uh, that are very useful for structuring the system and very convenient when you're programming, but also um, combining this with the monitoring aspects, the fault tolerance, um, that whole package, allowing you to build self-healing systems, essentially, uh, is extremely powerful. You will... Um, as far as I know, if you want to look for something similar, I guess Akka, in a sense, it was actually modeled after Erlang, and Cloud Haskell, which was also modeled after Erlang. They, too, they have more or less similar uh, constructs, although the concurrency model in the JVM is not quite the same. Um, Erlang is also quite nice for protocol programming, not too surprisingly, because that is also what it was initially designed for. Um, so it allows you to open what's called ports and just basically have processes running uh, state machines and doing uh, encode, decode very efficiently and very expressively. So you can um, write program logic for protocol programming that allows you to evolve the protocols very easily as well. Um, I'll get back to that a little bit later when I talk, to, talk about the complex state machine support. Now, complex state machines, how many of you have experience actually doing complex state machines? A few, uh, like one or two. Um, State machine programming can become like go-to programming, that once your problem expands, it can, it can pretty much explode in your face and become so complicated that you simply lose your thread. You, you don't understand your code anymore, and it can essentially kill your entire product if you're unlucky. That has actually, I've seen that happen several times in the telecom world where they have extremely complicated state machines often. Now, the functional programming part, actually, it helps a lot. I don't know if I need to talk about that so much anymore because I also saw on the DNA um, with the threads out there that a lot of people nowadays, uh, if they don't favor uh, functional programming, they may favor actually both functional and... Uh, so I'll assume that you are... Uh, that you are uh, familiar with the uh, benefits of functional programming. Now, Erlang doesn't enforce purity like, for example, Haskell does. It's mostly by convention. And um, also part of being opinionated in that it it's reasonably clear how you want to manage side effects in Erlang. So theoretically, you can sprinkle them all over the place. 
that's not what people do. Partly because Erlang has something called behaviors that are essentially uh, manifestations of design patterns. So you will have a module that implements, for example, a generic server behavior, a supervisor behavior, state machine behavior, and they have prescribed callbacks and they do most of the heavy lifting and you, you basically inject your program logic. And um, that actually gives um, a lot of Erlang components a very uh, uniform style which also helps uh, with reuse. Uh, I haven't looked at it in a while, but actually the reuse aspect of Erlang is quite, quite high. I don't know how it compares to the other modern languages, but if you compare it to older languages, uh, there is a tremendous amount of reuse in Erlang, and it's fairly easy to read other people's code. So, Another thing that's unusual about Erlang is what I would call a carrier class product mentality. Since Erlang grew out of the telecoms world and then you had uh, other users like, well, Facebook chat came out and uh, then you had WhatsApp. You had people who picked up Erlang were people who were really serious about building stuff that would stay up always. And you know, if you're looking for a programming language for fancy GUIs, don't look, at, don't look to Erlang. It's not so much that you couldn't write that kind of code in Erlang, it's just nobody does. So you don't have great library support for it, you don't have great community support, but if you're looking at fault tolerance, uh, robustness, you have awesome support because that's what everyone in the community does. The Erlang VM has been around for about 20 years. It's extremely stable. It's extremely efficient. Ericsson has a team of 20 programmers who have essentially the same programmers who were there 20 years ago. Uh, they're still working on it, and they're, they're doing a, a wonderful job. Ericsson is actually using this in their radio base station. So it's a pretty good guarantee that they're going to keep uh, quality up on this. Um, I put there basically attack-proof networking support. There have been some web servers out there, you know, there are security advisories around uh, web servers. Yaws, for example, has been around for years. It's an Erlang-based web server. If you go out looking for security advisories on that, there will be like one or two ever. Um, one reason for that is that you have this port concept and um, that, that's a bit of C code that runs in the VM, extremely carefully tested and maintained. And in your Erlang code, well, you don't have buffer overflows, you have um, essentially a, a nice functional declarative language where you write your protocol code. And that makes it really, really hard to attack um, protocol implementations written in Erlang. And that's very nice. Now, <clears throat> for the bad parts, well, not that many other projects are actually using blockchain or Erlang for blockchains, which means we have to build pretty much everything from scratch. But, and we've ported some things from Go, for example, um, then again, if you want to have uh, full responsibility for your application, porting something is a really good way of, of learning that code uh, from the inside out. Erlang doesn't run on uh, iOS, certainly not on iOS, um, and not really on Android. You can run Erlang in Termux if you want to, but it's not really a solution. Um, this is not so much of a disadvantage. A lot of people, for some reason, want to mine on their mobile. I have absolutely no idea why you would want to do that. Uh, but 
essentially running a blockchain node on your mobile is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. You might want to run state channels, though. Let me talk about those later. Let's see. This is just the dependencies we use. We, uh, I'm going to skip that. These are the build and test uh, tools we use. Uh, Erlang specific. They're OK. They're not fantastic. Uh, quick check is. I'll mention that briefly. Here, quick check. How many of you have heard of quick check? OK, about a third. QuickCheck is a tool actually invented in the Haskell world. Uh, there is a commercial uh, implementation in Erlang, and the company Cuvic actually maintains it. This is part of our QuickCheck code. Um, a lot to read on a single slide. What this does, this is this particular test uh, will for the two different v contract VMs that we have implemented, it will generate chunks of actual source code for various things, uh, aspects in the... Um, so it will generate code, random code, on the fly and uh, make sure that it can compile and run. Now, Generating random code would be a terrible idea unless you could do controlled random randomness so that you are actually fully in charge of whether the output is constitutes valid code or optionally with some probability invalid code in ways that are interesting. And you have full control of this. And it will generate lots and lots of hundreds or thousands. Usually, we will run this overnight. So it will generate hundreds of thousands of tests. And if it finds some problem or some generated code in this case, some input that should work but doesn't, it will start going backwards. It will simplify that. It will start reducing it in different ways in a, using a specific heuristic until it finds a minimal example where there is basically nothing you can reduce and still have it fail. And then it presents that. This is extremely powerful. And we've found quite a few of the kind of bugs that would normally bite you a couple of years down the line when some nerd figured out that you could exploit a piece of code in some really unintuitive way and then started making money that way or printing money as you could do on, the, on a blockchain. QuickCheck has saved us a number of times. Now, you can actually use this for other... There are QuickCheck implementations for other languages and the Erlang QuickCheck actually also can operate on C code where it automatically generates the stub code to test your C code. This is pretty amazing. Now, the VM. <clears throat> Why would you want to run, write a VM in a language like Erlang? Turns out that it's not such a bad idea. Um, this is a virtual machine. The Fast Eternity Transaction Engine is a virtual machine for the Sophia contract language. Now, first we implemented a VM that was more or less compatible with the Ethereum VM, which is a typical VM, low-level uh, instruction set VM. Fate is a different beast. It essentially um, builds on the, um, the um, realization that if you have a contract running in a blockchain, the thing that's going to be really expensive is when it interacts with the chain. Uh, the crypto, the dealing with the transactions, calling other contracts, and just dealing with the environment there is going to be uh, the costly part. As it turns out, we have already implemented all those. So we have then instruction codes 
that are at the level of the first class objects that we have. And those are, by doing it that way, we can, I had that on the previous slide, we could actually reduce the code size of the compiled code by 90%. Now, code size is also a cost because that goes into the block and the blocks are expensive. Remember, they're very slow, therefore they're expensive. So this actually uh, makes it a lot cheaper, a lot more efficient, and we can have more contracts in a block and we can execute them more cheaply. So, you know about Tenspun's, Greenspun's 10th rule. Any sufficiently complicated CO Fortran program can, that contains an ad hoc informally specified bug ridden slow implementation of half of common Lisp. Um, essentially, if you want to implement a VM from scratch, the advice would be don't because it's too hard. Um, but when you think of it, what is Erlang? Well, it's a very uh, robust and efficient VM with a fairly tiny symbolic language on top that happens to be quite good at metaprogramming and symbolic evaluation. So essentially, you have your VM already. Um, so that, in that sense, it actually makes a lot of sense to do it this way. And the whole VM is about 8,000 lines of code. Not much. And it works quite well. And I think the latest version was written in two months by admittedly great programmers. So, <clears throat> oh, I'm running out of time. State channels. This is actually where Erlang starts shining. So, very quickly, the idea of state channels, since blockchains are extremely slow, is you take some money, it's like your coffee card. You load some money into a separate channel that's off-chain, and in that channel, you can transact very quickly. You have to co-sign everything because it's still no trust, and eventually you can pull your, your money back out. You can also run contracts in that channel, and uh, basically you can do it for free because it doesn't hit the chain, so it's not expensive. So this allows you to still have the no trust and still have the connection to the chain. And it's all great, except people have tried to do this for several years now, and there are no really usable implementations of state channels. So, because they're extremely complex, what we've done is that we decided that we will implement the finite state machine, and we will let the uh, uh, client simply just tell us what it wants done. We'll do all the state machine programming, and then we'll tell the client when it needs to sign something. So that's essentially the API. I want to transfer some tokens. OK, sign this. And you sign, send it back signed, and then it's all done, essentially. This complicates the state machine tremendously. Uh, our bet is that Erlang will help us enough with a complicated state machine design that uh, we will be able to do this. I have a whole talk, QCon, and it was InfoQ, about the problems of complicated state machine design, complex state machine design. I will uh, just refer to that talk. On, on that. Now, this is where Erlang really pays off. Essentially, this would be the processes, some of them, for one state machine session, where you have the WebSocket handler is one process, the state channel FSM here that does the complex state machine work. You have a process that simply watches the chain because you could subvert the channel by posting transactions directly on the chain, and you have to detect that. Uh, this is an encrypted protocol similar to TLS, but it's called noise, very nice. This process terminates the noise protocol, but also encodes and decodes the messages so that this FSM can actually pattern match directly on the decoded message, which simplifies 
the FSM design greatly. And um, so then on the other side, you have the same thing. So essentially it's, what, eight processes per session. And we're hoping that maybe we could handle tens of thousands of sessions on, uh, on one node. That will not be a big problem. So, not have time to get into this, but essentially this is what the state machine would see, a pattern match with the message decoded, everything ready. So then you just jump directly from the pattern matching into the uh, state machine coding. And this is extremely powerful and uh, we're still trying to figure out how deep this hole is with state machine programming or state channel programming. It is extremely, extremely complicated. But we're doing reasonably well, actually, so far. So I would say blockchain technology is a moving target. And uh, when you're dealing with that, it's very nice to have a dynamic symbolic language like Erlang that gives you the loose coupling, the uh, support for basically evolving components reasonably freely, separately, and still have the very tight runtime coupling without sacrificing isolation or robustness. So it's actually turned out reasonably well so far. We're uh, respected at least for our, uh, we're considering considered to be one of the most productive blockchains in the market right now. So we're getting a lot of uh, compliments on our quality, our productivity, and uh, vision, I guess. And then we'll see how much that is worth in the end. All the things I've talked about are open source, except for the Cubic Quick Check. The, um, you can look at our, our test code, that's open source. The tool itself, you'd have to pay for. There is an open source equivalent, reasonably equivalent, called Proper in Erlang. And for other languages, you'd have to, uh, you'd have to look at um, what's out there for them. The, um, the whole Eternity state channel, or uh, blockchain, is open source. We have a foundation with um, incubators and, um, and where you can actually apply for grants if you want to do something interesting on it. So I invite you to take a look at that if you're interested in this field.